Hello everyone. Welcome to today's TechSoup webinar, and thank you for joining us. My name is Crystal, and I'll be your host. Today's webinar is Every Kid Ready to Read, Tech Tools for Early Literacy. We have two guests who will share their expertise on this topic, and we're very excited to welcome them. Uh, before we begin, I have just a few announcements to share. We'll be using the ReadyTalk platform for our meeting today. Please use the chat in the lower left corner to send questions and comments to the presenters. We will be tracking your questions throughout the webinar, and we'll answer them at the designated Q&A section at the end. All of your co uh, comments in the chat will only come to the presenters, but if you have comments or ideas to share, we'll forward them back out to the entire group. You don't need to raise your hand to ask a question. Simply type it into the chat box. Should you get disconnected during the webinar, you can reconnect using the same link in your confirmation email. You should be hearing the conference audio through your computer speakers, but if your audio connection is unclear, you can dial in using the phone number in your confirmation email. If you are having technical issues, please send us a chat message, and we will try to assist you. This webinar is being recorded, and it will be archived on the TechSoup website. If you are called away from the webinar, or if you have connection issues, you can watch a full recording of this webinar later. You will receive an archive email within 24 hours that will include a link to the recording, the PowerPoint slides, and any additional links or resources shared during the session. If you are tweeting this webinar, please use the hashtag TS4LIBS. We have someone from TechSoup live tweeting this event, so please join us in the conversation there. TechSoup connects nonprofits, charities, libraries, and foundations with tech products and services, as well as information so that you can make informed decisions about technology. During the past 17 years, TechSoup has distributed over 11 million technology donations to over 200,000 nonprofit organizations, libraries, and charities in over 60 countries worldwide. You can learn more at TechSoup.org. TechSoup offers programs, hardware, and services through their product donation program. For more information about TechSoup product donations or services, please visit us online at TechSoup.org and click on Get Products and Services. TechSoup for Libraries addresses the specific needs of, of te technology needs of public libraries. And TechSoup for Libraries gathers stories from public libraries about how they are utilizing technology and shares them via webinars, blog posts, and the TechSoup for Libraries monthly newsletter. Find these stories and sign up for our newsletter at TechSoupForLibraries.org. With that, uh, we are ready to begin today's webinar, Every Kid Ready to Read, Tech Tools for Early Literacy. For today's webinar, we are going to focus on some best practices for integrating technology into early literacy programming. I hope today's webinar gives you a few ideas that you can apply in your organization. Today we are joined by two guests who will share some of the innovative work being done in their organizations. Tanya Smith is the Program Coordinator at the Fred Rogers Center. She designs and delivers professional development workshops to early educators and parents and has been working in early literacy and early childhood learning for more than 15 years. Lori Crocker is a Youth Services Librarian at Douglas County Libraries in Colorado, and is an advocate for incorporating technology into story times and other library programming. My name is Crystal Schimpf, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Assisting us with chat, we have Becky Wiegand, Manager of the Webinar Program here at TechSoup. We also have Ginny Meese of TechSoup for Libraries team joining us on Twitter using the at TechSoup for Libs handle. Just a reminder if that you, is that if you are also on Twitter during the webinar, please use the hashtag TS4LIBS. Now, during this webinar, we'll be presenting a blend of resources, research, and recommended practices. Uh, now, every day there are new apps and technologies being made available to young children, and we know that when used correctly, technology can be used to increase early literacy skills. We hope that after this webinar, your library or nonprofit will be more confident bringing technology into children's programming. We will have time for questions at a few points throughout the webinar. Please send us your questions using the chat as they arise, and we'll address as many questions as we are able to. If you ask a question that we're not able to get to during the webinar, we will follow up later with you via email. 
And you can also ask us a question on Twitter. Just a reminder that all of the resources that we share today will be available in the webinar archive. Now first, uh, we'd like to learn just a little bit about your experiences. Tell us um, if you are currently or have recently included technology in your programs for kids age 0 to 5. Um, to answer the poll, all you have to do is click the radio button and then click Submit. Um, I also invite you to share any specific examples of programs or services you've provided by typing them into the chat, and we'll share some of those back out with the entire group. So I'll give you a few seconds. I can see the responses are coming in. And we'll give you just a few seconds for those of you who are still uh, thinking about this. I know sometimes it's a little bit of a gray area. Um, and, and we can see a large, so far I'm seeing a very large percentage, over half have um, provided some technology programs and services, but um, close to about 40% have not. Um, and then also if you include those of you who may not be sure, and I know some of you may um, not be sure of, of everything happening in your organization, and I will say that's okay too. I'm going to um, go ahead and close the poll in just a second here. So if you're still submitting your response, go ahead and send that in. It looks like we've gotten most of the responses I think we're going to get. So I'm going to close the poll now. And I do just want to say that um, for those of you who already have some experience in this, or your organization, your library already has some experience, hopefully pick, you pick up some new tips that you are able to apply. Uh, but for those of you who are new to the topic, hopefully this helps you form a foundation and maybe give you the confidence to um, try some of this out. And we hope that you gain some of that through the webinar today. So thanks for answering our poll and sharing your experience with us. Um, now I'm going to share some resources with you. And I'm, I'm going to go through these fairly quickly because most of these are going to be mentioned later on in the webinar. But I wanted to just give you an idea of what we're going to be looking at. Um, first off, uh, we're taking a look at some research and recommendations today. And when it comes to early learning and technology, it's a good idea to understand that research. Um, and, and we have quite a few uh, national organizations who are involved in this. Um, the NAEYC is National Association for the Education of Young Children. Uh, the Fred Rogers Center is at St. Vincent University. And the Technology and Early Childhood Center, the Tech Center, is part of the Erickson Institute. Um, and uh, these um, organizations provide a wealth of information and all, are all involved in research and best practices in some capacity. And the links to these organizations will be included in the archive of this webinar. We also have some uh, resources, some websites that are um, uh, good to have on hand. These provide um, some some type of product or app reviews and recommend best practices, these four that you have listed on your screen. Uh, Little Elit is a blog site that does reviews, best practices, and program ideas uh, very specific to libraries. And again, these links will include them in the archive. Um, LE or ELE stands for Early Literacy Environment, and that comes from the Fred Rogers Center. And I know Tanya is going to tell us a little bit more about that later. Um, Common Sense Media and Digital Storytime are two websites that provide reviews and guidance um, on app and technology for um, young children specifically. So that's uh, a, a couple of other resources you may want to look into uh, there. I can see lots of ideas are coming into the chat as well. And so if you have other sites that you like to access for um, technology and early, early literacy or early childhood learning, then um, please share them with us and we'll try to compile those in the archive as well. Now one last resource I want to share with you is something um, uh, that's available through the TechSoup product donation program. And I want to make sure you're aware of it. Um, reading Eggs is an online reading education program that utilizes songs, games, and rewards to motivate kids. And this product is available to libraries and nonprofits at a significant discount. Your organization can receive one subscription pack with a, a uh, 10 licenses, so one pack with 10 licenses, as long as you meet the eligibility guidelines for public library or nonprofit status. Um, for more details on this, be sure to visit TechSoup.org and browse to Reading Eggs on the product donation page. Well, now I think it's time to introduce uh, Tanya and hand the mic over to her. And she's going to tell us about some of the research-based recommendations with regards to technology and early childhood learning. So Tanya, please tell us more. Uh, thank you. And good morning or good afternoon to all of you out there. Um, I'm, we have people rep represented from all over the place, which is fantastic. Um, again, my name is Tanya Smith. I'm from the Fred Rogers Center. 
we are quite frequently confused with the Fred Rogers, which is um, a production company. So they produce Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood and Peg Plus Cats. At the center, we focus um, on media on a, in a broader way and also in the way for recommendations and the best uses of technology and media. And we are also located out in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, Fred Rogers' first neighborhood. And it's where he was born and was raised. Um, so we're his first neighborhood. I believe Pittsburgh was his second. <laughs> um, our mission has recently changed and it's been newly revised and looks at the overall work of Fred Rogers himself. And it actually comes from a comment from Fred's wife, Joanne. When it's staying true to the vision of Fred Rogers, we help children grow as confident, competent, and caring human beings, which we hope to do through some of the elements of our work, which is looking at how we can um, have children grow on the inside, how do they learn through strong relationships with others, and also how do we give meaning to technology. Um, and if you're familiar with Fred Rogers or Mr. Rogers, um, he had this way of just connecting to his audience through the biggest source of media, which was television, and it still actually still is the biggest source of media. Um, he had this great way of just talking to people almost as if you were having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him, even though it was coming through a television screen. And it's really fascinating to find that people, adults and children alike, established a relationship with him without ever possibly ever meeting him in person. So we hope to look at what's out there today and create these next generations of people that are able to inspire and create media that builds on relationships and sustains them. Um, and a large part, and I, and I believe that Crystal had said this, at the center is to create and deliver a professional development or workshops around developmentally appropriate practice when using these kind of media tools and technology. Um, and you'll see all of my work is centered in a position statement that was written by two of our senior career fellows. Uh, well, they were co-authors on this. It was Chip Donahue at the Tech Center at Erickson and also Roberta Schomburg at Carlo University. They're two of our, um, like I said, they're our senior career fellows. And the position statement along with NAEYC is the foundation for everything that I do, everything in the work that I do, and all of the workshops and um, professional development that I provide. So it is the basis or the foundation. I sometimes call it the, the theory of um, what I do. So just out of curiosity, because I'm trying to figure out how many people are actually familiar with the position statement on young children in technology, if you could go ahead and answer the poll. Either yes, I've read it, yes, but I haven't read it, or no, I'm not at all familiar. It'd be great. I see some of them are coming in. So I'll give you a few seconds, a few beats. All right, so it looks like we've slowed down, and most of our people have had an opportunity to answer. So I'll give you another second to get in there. Going once. Oh, a few more. All right, I'm getting ready to close it. All right, so it looks like this is not uncommon. 66.1% um, of people are not at all familiar with the position statement. Um, if you, and we have about 34% that are familiar and have not read it. So that's about where we're starting to see um, statistically, that's where those numbers are showing. And that is also part of my role with the center is to start to let people know about the position statement and how it affects practice in informal environments and formal learning environments. So if you have not visited, which many of you have not, the NAEYC website, there is um, connections to all kinds of different position statements in early education. And again, this looks like it's written for the classroom teacher, but it's also written for anybody who's working with young children. So there is a link there for you to, to link right into the position statement. It's a great resource for you because it gives you 
the full position statement, the key messages, um, gives you examples. There is a short webinar on there, and it's a dynamic space because it is updated quite frequently. Um, and it also has a webcast there with Chip Donahue and Roberta Schomburg who were the um, co-authors. So moving into what is called the key messages of the position statement. And if you're familiar with Cliff Notes or Spark Notes, I always kid and say this is the Cliff Notes or Spark Notes of, of key messages. And um, so we, ha we start with about six of them. And the first one is when used intentionally and appropriately, technology and interactive media are effective tools to support learning and development. You see I have this line there that says enhance and not replace. Part of the idea behind that is that if you can do that without technology, then do it without technology. But if it can enhance something that you're already doing, beef up what you're doing, make it more exciting, make, get, give more information to your, to your young children. And the reason I have that picture of the trees in the one corner is that it's very common for children to learn about seasons and the life cycles of trees and those kind of things. So how could technology be used to enhance that process? We've had lots of early educators have children take pictures of the trees as they change, record videos around the process of that. And it's just something simple that you can watch the transition of the tree where normally it looks like, oh, you know, we're through fall and it looks like all the leaves just all of a sudden fell off the tree. Um, but if you take it, an intentional picture daily or every other day, that transitions a little slower and they get a whole lot more information about that process. A friend of mine from a researcher from Australia often refers to it as you want to use technology to do something that you already can't do. You, know, you want to use it for that reason. Um, and we look at the word intentional, we're talking about thoughtful practice. We're talking about how, what, when, and why are you using technology, really thinking through that process, really planning for it. Um, we're looking at all technology through a developmentally appropriate lens um, and always viewing it that way. A lot of people become a little afraid of technology, but we view it just as another tool that people are using every day. So you're, we have a, a lot of librarians here who are using books all the time as tools, who are using arts and crafts activities all the time as tools, paper, pencils. Technology is just another tool to be added to that group of tools that you already own and use very well. Um, effective, does it, advance, does it advance what you're trying to teach? Are they learning from it? And then another word in there, the last word in there is supporting. Does it support the child's learning and work? It's a very important message in, in the first message there. Um, key message two is looking at it, this intentional use requires early childhood teachers and administrators and other early childhood professionals to have information and resources regarding the nature of these tools. Um, have found that quite often people who are working with young children are given new tools but not really told about how to use them or why to use them or when to use them. So it, that information needs to come along with those. There, one example that I use all the time is I was talking to a group of early educators and there was one person who, was, who received a smart board and she didn't know how to use it. So she actually used it as a bulletin board, um, thinking about a $5,000 bulletin board. Um, goes right back to this, this statement that people need to have that information. It's very important. Third key message looks at limitations on the use of technology and media are very important. So we're looking at a lot of times when people think of limitations, they think of time. But it also is about balance. It's about is the media passive or is it active? Are the children consuming media or are they creating media? Looking at those, we really are, and the reason the active and creator are highlighted is because that's what we're really looking at. Are children actively engaged in the process and are they potentially creating new media or new tools from this? Um, and also looking at professional judgment is very important. So a lot of times, 
people are caught up in the amount of time. Oh, children should only be using media a certain amount of time. Um, that's kind of arbitrary. So we want to look at content. What exactly are they doing? If they're doing something very creative and active, we may allow that to extend a little bit longer. And, um, I'll okay, go back for a second. A, a, an example of a creation of media is, like, is my, uh, my own children when they were very young. They were four, love, and I have twins. They were very engaged in creating their own videos and with a digital camera, and, um, which they could now do with a tablet um, or a phone. They would write scripts. They would make costumes. They would have sets. And this would go on for hours. That is certainly something that was very active and very creative, and I would let it go on for hours. Using my best parental judgment, I allowed that to continue for those reasons. Uh, the fourth message is about um, special considerations with infants and toddlers. And the position statement highlights that as long as the media is building relationships and sustaining relationships, there is some place with infants and toddlers. Um, thinking about a great example is children that FaceTime and Skype with long distance relevant with a long distance relative. There are lots of children who have parents that are deployed overseas or they have grandparents that are far away. Um, a very relationship building activity for this young child. And you think about all of the information that they get by meeting or seeing these folks that are far away. They see how they look. They see their mannerisms, how their mouth moves. There's a give and take response. So they learn a whole lot about that person through that technology. Also looking at another key message is the attention to digital citizenship and equitable access. Digital citizenship meaning how do – I always abbreviate it as how do we behave in this digital world? Um, and you think about how do you behave person to person, not sure that the rules are necessarily different in a d digital world, that you know, we're kind to people, we think about things before we put them out there, um, and providing um, access on a global perspective and within a smaller neighborhood and looking at our culture and what it allows us to do in, these, in this digital world. Um, so it's really a great, it's great to have conversations with young children early about how should they behave in this kind of space because they're connecting to others um, through games, through potentially email and through videos and those kind of things. So it's really important to start those, con those conversations early. Um, equitable, equitable access is making sure that people have access to digital media and technology in a large, on a large scale, um, that they're able to connect and learn and communicate with other people. So that is a, that is a huge challenge for us globally. Um, and lastly, uh, ongoing research and professional development are needed. We know that, um, but a couple of things that we have found and some, what is some of the research that we already have is starting to reveal is that, and I've said this probably a gazillion times already, is that relationships are most important for learning. Um, they're the foundation for all learning. So if we can engage children with media and technology around relationship building, that that's, gives us our biggest bang for our buck. Um, joint media engagement, it, which is another word, is like co-viewing for television or co-reading with children, story time with children. Um, so just the same kind of thing with anything that you're doing with children and technology. If you're playing a game on an iPad, that there is somebody else there playing the game with them, talking about the game with them, um, asking them questions about the game. Um, and then a great person um, who wrote this fantastic book called Screen Time, How Electronic Media from Baby Videos to Educational Software Affects Your Young Child, Lisa Guernsey, talks about content, context in the child, and content being you know, what is, what's on those things, what, it, what are they supposed to be learning, what's there. Um, it, it can involve also the characters. Um, the context is the environments that are meaningful. Um, where is the child exploring with this? Who is the child exploring this, this technology with? And the child, knowing the individual child, what are their abilities, what are their aptitudes, what are their dispositions? Um, 
So those are at least those three C's. And then we often add the fourth C, which I had talked about before, is creating media. Um, giving children the, 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 the ability to create and to explore media and learn from media in that way. So these are the things we know that happen. So if you're using, if you're using media in your libraries or in your nonprofit or in a classroom, looking at these things that are starting to show up in research are highly, highly important for their use. A couple links to check out is, um, and I'm, I know I'm a little bit short on time, so I'm going to go over these quickly. Um, Ellie is the early learning environment from the Fred Rogers Center. has a lot of great examples of activities for young children. Initially started as an early literacy site, but has grown to include other areas of, um, of curriculum. And it includes anything from videos, apps, online links to resources, online links to games. We have national and regional partners, PBS Kids 0 to 3, Carnegie Library, Carnegie Science Center. Um, and some of, the, some of the activities are high tech, some of them are no tech. Um, so there's a huge variety of activities. And below here there's also links to NACI, to the Fred Rogers Center, and also to the Tech Center at Erickson that Crystal had talked about at the beginning. And I believe my time is up. So if yeah. we have any, I will be answering questions as, um, as everybody else speaks. Thank you. Great. Well, well, Tanya, we have time for a question right now. And I just wanted to say thanks for sharing. Um, you know, there were so many key points in what, um, in what you just shared to us. And I know the slides will be very valuable to everybody. Um, and I just wanted to make sure everybody knows that you'll get the slides. And you'll also get in the archive um, a PDF of the position statement and a link to that page um, that Tanya mentioned where you can get all the additional details. So you will um, get all of that in the archive. Now, Tanya, somebody asked a question about the position statement and wondering if there's a version that's more directed towards parents and caregivers than towards educators and librarians. That's a really great question. And no, not at this time. And that doesn't mean that something's not coming because we are currently working on a kind of poster version that has some quotes from Fred that talk about what's in the position statement. Um, so it's not available yet, but I'm hoping within the next couple of months we have some students at St. Vincent College that are working on that. Um, I often will also tell people just to kind of take what's in the key messages and uh, make it more relevant for parents. I hope, yeah, I ho and if, if you have any problems doing that, you can just send me an email or talk to me and I'll help you do that. Great, thanks. And I think you're a, a fantastic resource for all of us, and, and we're happy to have you on the call here. Um, you, you know, And with all the resources that we're talking about, um, uh, Deborah actually wanted to know, are these links, uh, are these resources fee-based, or are they available to anybody for free? Um, all of the resources through the Fred Rogers Center, through LE, and through NACI um, are free. Fantastic. Fantastic. That's uh, great. And, and, and good news for libraries, uh, whether you're a large or small library, of course, having access to anything that doesn't have an additional cost is certainly a benefit. So um, very good, very good. Well, I think we have time for maybe one more question before we move on. Um, and, and I okay. think more questions are starting to come in. So since they are, um, we'll take maybe one more right now, and then we'll see if any more come in before the end. Um, someone has asked, you know, how do you um, introduce the importance of relationships um, to, uh, or, or relationships with regards to technology use to parents? Um, how can we pass that information on to parents? Do you have any suggestions? Um, I would say that you, first of all, you could be a really great role model. So in your libraries, which most of you are in library systems, is showing that in your story times, showing them how you're engaging the children in your library setting. Um, if you're doing that at this point, and maybe showing or maybe talking to parents about, hey, look at how she did this or how he did this. Um, just being a real, I would say just showing through example is probably the best way to do it with parents. Um, because for, being a parent myself, and I'm sure many of you are, I really don't like people to tell me what to do. I would, ra I would rather kind of see what they're doing and have them show me what to do. Um, so I would, I would start there. And then you could say something like, Oh, and 
And research is showing that when you sit side by side with your child, that this is actually where they receive the most benefit. Great. And that well, comes that's... from the Joan Coon, the Joan Gens Cooney Center. There was a whole um, research or a whole paper written on joint media engagement. Great. All right, so maybe that's another thing. We'll try to get the link for that and if it's available yeah. and include that in the archive as well. And um, making a very good point that, you know, maybe, um, it, you know, we have to find a, a, it is true that we have to find a gentle way to talk to parents about uh, this and, and telling them is maybe not the best way and showing them is perhaps uh, preferred. So great advice there. Um, so thanks, Tanya, for answering those questions and for all of your presentation. Um, we'll come back to see if there are more questions towards the end. But right now okay. uh, we're going to move on and uh, uh, welcome Lori to the call. Um, Lori is going to get into the specifics of delivering story time programs that include technology. So Lori, please uh, share your program ideas with us. Thank you, Crystal. I started doing digital elements in my story times about two years ago when we got the right equipment put in place. So what we were able to do in our story time room was mount a television and an Apple TV on the wall towards the front and side. Then using our wireless connection, we were able to uh, mirror our iPad to that TV. Once I got all of that equipment in place, I was able to start doing digital story times on uh, almost every time I do story time, digital elements in my story time, which is really was really exciting to me because previous to that we had to plug an adapter into a projector and that really m limited my movement. But it was it's a way that people can see what I'm doing on the device across the entire room by having it mounted to the wall and mirrored to the TV. Now at home, I'm a little bit cheaper, so I use Chromecast because that's only $35 and my cheaper tablet, and I do a lot of the exact same things at home. So I have used a few different technologies in my equipment, but once I got that equipment in place, I really got to start using digital elements regularly in programming, especially my story time, which I get to do more than once a week. So I get really excited about um, using it now because I have so many things put in place. And getting there, however, was a lot different. I started out with a great sense of digital elements in story time because I had a coworker who had paved a path for me. Her name is Melissa De La Pena. And there's a handout that everybody's going to get included in the archive that has one of her articles that she and a coworker with her, Kate Lucy, had written about putting digital elements in story time. And because she had paved the way, I felt really good about using digital elements in story time. But I wanted to take ownership. And so I started really looking into different resources. And many of these were highlighted before, but Little Elit not only has this amazing logo of this little boy with the iPad, but it also feels like you're eavesdropping on a conversation with other professionals. And I like to look at Little Elit as a resource that is very relevant to me in what I'm doing because they're trying to do the same thing. Whereas Digital Storytime has lots of great resources, Common Sense has lots of great resources that I wouldn't find other places. They're more of this is what's out there. Little Elit feels more like a conversation. So I really do like using Little Elit as one of my uh, resources. Then instead of skipping over the app reviews and professional journals, I started reading them. Um, and it became, uh, it became another resource for me. School Library Journal, Hornbook, Kirkus, Publishers Weekly all do reviews on different apps. So I now make a point of looking when I'm going through the professional journals at looking at all of those reviews. But probably what I do the most is look at the editor pick and top app list picks for Google Play and iTunes. And the reason I do so is because this is the list that parents and caregivers are really using they are, that's where they're going. They're going to the, the Play Store and the iTunes um, store to, to look at things. And especially the free apps, I just want to be in tune with what they're doing. So I definitely use those quite a bit just as a resource so that I can feel very confident when I am talking to parents and caregivers. From there, once I've got my list, I start to consider deeper about those specific apps that I've gotten off the list. So 
my biggest thing when I am considering what apps that I'm going to use in Storytime is the purpose. What is the purpose of this app and how does it connect to what I'm doing in Storytime? It has to serve a purpose beyond being awesome and fun for me. Um, being awesome and fun is a perk, but that's not the purpose. So I definitely have to look at the purpose of the app and how I can explain that. The app developers, we all have kind of our own little favorites after you get into the app world for a while. DuckDuckMoose is amazing. Um, they're so much fun and have so many great apps. But there are also many others. Noisy Crow, Loud Crow, they do a lot of book interactive book apps. Originator, of course, did Endless ABC or Endless Alphabet, which is a um, pretty hot app. And Lazoo has some really interesting apps. One of the ones that I love that not as many people know about is called Fox and Sheep, and they're out of the UK. They're Brits. But they have built really lush worlds in their apps, very, um, very cool things. So I, I look at those people. I look at their new apps that are coming out, and they are something that I definitely consider because I know them and I know their quality. I do look at descriptions of the apps as well. It's not as easy to tell from a description because they're trying to sell their app. So what I've done with looking at descriptions of app is also go to YouTube because there's a lot of videos on YouTube that will show the apps in action. So that gives me a really nice idea of what the app in action looks like so I can tell if I want to use it or not. Reviews are important. They're not the most important. Not everybody's going to use the app the same way I am. I'm looking at it from a story time point of view, and a lot of people are looking at it from a home based point of view. But I do take a look at the reviews just to give myself a good idea. And of course, price. I mean, that's one of the things in libraries you always have to look at when you're purchasing anything is, is it worth the price? In Douglas County Libraries, we have multiple iPads on one account. So if I purchase an app with the budget that was given to me two years ago of $200 that I'm still using, if I purchase it, it goes to all of those people who are using Storytime iPads. So that's a really nice point for using an account like that where you can, you can have one purchase, one purchase point that is used across the entire district, which is really helpful for us. But I really heavily consider if it's going to be worth it um, in the long run for all of us to, to buy things. Books, a little bit more than games. I think the price is usually worth it. So when I got started with doing digital elements, uh, there are a few things that really made it, made it work. The first was getting really comfortable with the equipment. Know what angle you can turn the television on with the remote. It's important. Know how your iPad is going to react and when to do things like this. I like to swap in one digital element at a time. Uh, when I got started, that was one of the things that I always did. So I used an interactive book instead of a large book or a physical book in that story time room. I can tell you Endless Alphabet works as a great flannel board swap. Uh, you get to uh, choose a word. All those letters in the word get mixed up. Everybody points to the letter and we put them back in order. And as we're pointing to the letter and moving it, we're making the sound of the letter. So where we're moving that R, we're going R until that gets there. And once our word is put back together, there's a little video with the definition. So your vocabulary building with that app as well as doing phon phonetic awareness. It's really cool. There's also a felt board app and a Mother Goose felt board app that are really easy to swap in as your felt board for that day. And the Mother Goose felt board even does the songs, so you get to sing too. So I also did a complete run through ahead of time of every app I was using from beginning to end. A lot of apps have what I call hotspots. I think I saw that somewhere along the line. And the hotspot of a book is when you can animate it or make it do something. If you shake it, then the sugar falls down to the bottom of the screen. And knowing where those things are and knowing how to move things forward, turn a page, go to the next game, is really important so that you're not in the middle of a group and hesitating and losing your flow and losing your focus. As many people who do story times know, the flow of a program is going to either make it successful or kill you. And so you definitely want to know where things are. and practice 
the whole app ahead of time, as well as the transition into using and out of using. I have to turn on a television, turn on, the, wake up the iPad, uh, I have to mirror the iPad to the television and open the app a lot because of the things that time out. And so if I make sure that I have that done ahead of time or I have something on the screen that is a slide of a song that we're doing and then moving it off the screen, I need to know how to go in and out of that and what I'm going to be saying and what I'm going to be doing. Another thing that I think is rather important is the idea that Tanya said that it, technology is another tool. It's a tool like doing a book or singing a song or all of those things. And so you definitely don't need to make a big deal that you're using technology because even though it's fun and interesting a lot of times, it really is another tool that you're using to make a statement. And that's what I would want to really emphasize is the idea of making a statement. Um, I want to be the authoritative resource. I want to be the person that they're asking questions to. I want to know the name of the app, the purpose of the app, and how much it costs. And I actually usually, in transitions, explain all of those things right then and there. I make sure to connect everything back to what I use as my pulse point for story time, which is Every Child Ready to Read. The practices that we are trying to teach in, every ch in, in story time to get kids ready with early literacy, those apps better be able to be explained by those practices as well if I am going to use them. And so I try to, when I explain the purpose, connect it right back to that, because that's what the families are familiar with me doing. That's what in story time a lot of librarians are doing. And then I also em emphasize the importance of the, the caregiver in the interaction. A lot of times I put the uh, iPad out 15 minutes before the story time starts, and I have a app on it, and the kids are using that app. It's mirrored to the screen so everybody can see it, that what the kid is doing on that app, and we're switching them through so that they're getting experience. And then I am modeling what I would do as a caregiver with a child using that app. So it's really cool about... Um, being able to see what's going on. So really quickly, I'm going to go through some of my favorite apps that I use during story time, and I'm going to connect them all right back to every child ready to read. So we're going to start with read, as that is probably the biggest one of librarians, <laughs> because we all read multiple books. And it's probably the easiest one to switch in and out. Interactive book apps are ones that have added animations to them, and a lot of them are apps that you would use or purchase. And so Go Away Break Green Monster is my office mate's absolute favorite app in the entire world because you can read it along with Ed. You can read it yourself, which is what I typically do. And then there's this fantastic song. So you're reading. And the colors are changing just like it does with the book. But then you're sing you can sing this song afterwards and re reinforce all of those wonderful things through singing it. And it's a great song. Storybots is really fun because it's got tons of books and you get new books all every month. And you get to take a picture and put whatever you take a picture of in that story. Photograph of myself, so Miss Lori stars in the book a lot, um, but also a dog or a kid, and it's really fun. I did want to take a, a minute to say the Wrong Book app, which is by Nick Bland, is a fantastic app, but it's one of those apps that has so much stuff to it that you can get overwhelmed with the, the, the things that you're doing. So that's one where I practice what I'm going to touch and what I'm not going to touch. Don't get, forget things that your library already has, like tumble books, overdrives. It's a way to promote things that they can use at home, and so it's me showcasing them when, I, when I'm doing them. For Write, there is another great list of apps out there that you can use. I like Little Writer. It's a very straightforward. You trace the shape. You trace the word. You trace the letter, and you can do upper and lowercase letters, and it's completely free. So it's a very easily ac accessible. It's one of those great apps that are on both Google Play and the iTunes Store, so I can use it with anybody and tell everybody about it. Make a Mosaic is really fun as well. It's one of those apps that you can do symmetry lines. So a lot of the letters in the alphabet have symmetry lines like H, A, W. So you can start writing a letter up on and have it mirrored up on the screen, and they can guess what that letter is. 
and make the letter themselves. And they can make uh, many other images as well. So I like that one. And then Lazu has a one called Squiggles that's really fun because the very first thing that you're, those kids are doing in early literacy are just making shapes. So. Squiggles, they have something like a car, and then you squiggle behind it, and it's really fun that way. And then they, you hit go, and those cars move. It becomes animated. Sing is probably one of the easier ones. Um, there's great apps for it. I, I included Rosemary Wells, Head and Shoulders, Knees and Toes, because it has multiple languages. Little Fox Music Box, you can actually record them playing music. And then don't forget things like Freegal. Our library is lucky to have Freegal as one of the resources that they can download. And iTunes, because we share it across the board. And YouTube, this is Lori Berkner's The Goldfish Song. And it has kids actually doing the actions. And a father came up to me after I'd done this in a story time and said, thank you so much for using a video with children actually doing the actions. I think it's very valuable. Play is one of the easier ones, because there's games all over the place. Um, again, I really come back to that purpose. Cookie Doodle, I was so skeptical about, but it has a sequence, just like stories have a sequence. It has an open, a middle, and an end, and you talk about sequencing, so just build it up. And then you get to do all the actions together as you're making those cookies, and at the very end when you're eating them, you're making those ginormous noises like <coughs> and it's just hilarious and fun. Uh, Pika Zoo is by Duck Duck Moose, and that was one that I like because of the elements of emotion that they put in it. It's, a, it's one that goes along with talk as well. Um, so in the app, you'll go to a screen that says, who is winking, and identify which animal is winking. Who is trying to hide, and the pig is trying to hide. Who is Harry the hippo, and identifying that animal. There's a lot of emotion identifying who's crying, who's happy, which as another thing that even on the autistic spectrum, they do a lot of that with technology. So I, I like that about the app as well. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is the as talk. Sock puppets is hilarious. You get to record your voice, another person's voice, and the sock puppet animates what you say. So you know those books like Elephant Piggy by Mo Willems that you just really wish you had another person in the room to do the entire book with? You can actually do things like that with sock puppets where you can have two different voices going and use that as a talking situation. I Hear You is another app with that's a listening situation where you're having real animal noises, real transportation noises like cars, trucks, planes, that they can listen to and then emulate. Because as you know, that breaks down into the noises of language. And then don't forget to use things like Google Presentation or Prezi or other different things to put up pictures that are relevant, to put up videos that are relevant, to put up words to songs, to put up um, rhymes and things that are going to work well in with your talk, with getting parents to talk with you. So those are the five practices and some of my highlights. On the handout that you're getting, you will get a ton more ideas. Great. Uh, Lori, gosh, so many great apps here and certainly a lot of ideas. I'm sure everybody's um, minds are just filled with ideas right now. And we have <laughs> quite a few questions that have come in, so we want to make sure to get to some of those as well. But I just want to say thanks for sharing um, uh, not just the ideas but also your enthusiasm. I mean, I can just tell that this is something you're very passionate about and you uh, really love uh, incorporating this into your job. So um, that's great to hear. Um, now as far as the technology goes, I know you were largely focused on the iPad and, um, and there are some, some reasons for that. Um, were all of these apps only for iPad? Are there Android apps out, or other systems out there as well that um, if you have a different type of tablet or device you might be able to incorporate? So I look both in the Google Play Store and the iTunes Store. So the, the Google Play Store does Android apps as well as the iTunes Store. I, because of the work situation I am in and in, in the, in the equipment I have, do focus heavily on the iPad. And in all honesty, that still to this day is one of the most heavily used iPad and the iTunes Store is one of the most heavily used across the board. So it does relate pretty well to a wide audience. But many, including Endless ABC, Little Rider, many Cookie Doodle, are, many, many of these are available in both formats. 
Great, great. So it sounds like if you're if you've got an Android device or another type of device, there's options out there, many which mirror the iPad. Um, but if you're looking at getting into this and you don't currently have a tablet, there may be more options available in the iPad environment. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, with the longevity of the iPad being so prevalent, they a lot of people release to iPad first and then okay. it kind of transitions over to that Play Store. So it does seem to be more options in the iPad, especially to get started. Um, but some of the biggest ones you would be able to go in either format. Great. Great. Now another um, technology-based question, and, and I'm not sure if this is something you know off the top of your head, um, but do you know how many devices you can uh, connect to one app, and, and do you need licenses to connect to multiple devices? Have you run into anything with that uh, specifically? With the way that I am able to do it, which is we have one account that we share out. I believe the last time I checked it was 11 devices, which we don't even have 11. We have six different libraries in our district all using the one iPad for each, it's each library. So, well, seven technically, but six of them have iPads. Um, so we, we are under our limit, but it is, it is not so low that it, it's not valuable to do it that way. It's a, it's a pretty good number of iPads that you can have on the same account. Great. Great. Um, and now, so we are getting more and more questions coming in. And now to transition maybe to looking at the um, actual uh, environment of the program that you deliver, we have a couple people asking, how large are the groups that you are presenting these story times to? How many kids and parents are typically there? I, I think my, my biggest group recently was 60 people. Um, that was around 40 children, 20, 20 adults. I typically don't have groups over that for a story time. I have groups as small as seven kids. And um, I think the largest group I've ever had for a normally scheduled story time is somewhere around 80, 60 kids, 20, 20 adults, something like that. So uh, pretty big groups. We get, we get tightly squeezed into our area. I have done other programs with more people that I do project. Um, but like I said, the limiting it limits me because I have to be so connected to mm -hmm. the wall on, on projecting for those bigger groups. So I, I use that a little more sparingly. Yeah, yeah. And in those large groups when you have um, – do you ever have kids interacting with the devices? Um, and are there sharing issues if they're coming up to touch the screen? Is there, do you ever have issues with that? I like to do the kids touching the device ahead of time and get it out of the way because mm -hmm. I don't want to invite the sharing issues. When I have such a tight group, I can't have people coming to the front of the room and back of the room very easily. There's a lot of stepping on each other, <laughs> um, which mm -hmm. we, we try to avoid in story time. I don't know. Um, so I actually do 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes ahead of time I have kids interacting. I'll even set it up after story time if I know there's some time for kids to interact. But during the course of the story time, unless it's a very small group, 10 or less, I am typically in ownership of the iPad, and they are using their physical body to mirror what I am doing on the iPad. Great, and that I think answers some of the other questions we had as well as far as when they're writing letters and whatnot. Um, so now one more question um, specific to the story times themselves um, and kind of thinking about the parents. Um, do you ever get any pushback from parents about using screens in the story time? And um, are you advertising it first so they know that it's going to be there? Um, how do you handle the parents? It, that's, a, that's a really interesting question, and it's a question that I've actually got a lot. The honest, question, the honest answer to that is very, very rarely do I have any push, pushback. And I think part of it is because I take the time to explain um, in the moment. I have one-sentence things that I will say that really un, uh, have them understand the purpose of why we're doing this together. You know, I say, we're going to replace a book with a book, or we're going to do the felt board up on the screen today because this allows me to, and then I explain why and what they can do with it at home. And I really try to build that into the experience. So at the end of the story time, the majority of the time, the only question I have is, what was the name of that app again? 
Um, <laughs> so it, it's very rare that I do have people who are vehemently against it. If there is pushback, I take the time right at the end of that story time to ignore putting everything away and take that, that person aside and have an entire conversation based on stuff that Tanya has said and based on some of the research I've done of why, why this is okay and why I do this. And um, I, I do not advertise it ahead of time, but most people know that Friday at 10.30 there's going to be digital elements at story time because that's the one I do the most regular. But I, have, I, do, I do a lot of other story times that I, I incorporated into that it's not advertised ahead of time, and I haven't had any, I haven't really had any hardcore um, pushback. Yeah, well good. Well thanks for sharing your experience there and also I think what you're getting at is that a little bit of preventive, you know, by, by presenting the information in a way you maybe are preventing some of the concern that might arise from parents. So you're, you're uh, speaking to it directly which I think is uh, great advice. Um, and, and Laura, you've given us so much advice and so many tips and so I want to thank you for sharing um, that with us. Um, I want to bring Tanya back on for just one more minute. And Tanya, I want to ask you if you have any last bits of advice or wisdom to share with uh, libraries. You know, again, we had a mix in the room of people who have been doing this for a while and, and some people who are new to it. So any last uh, advice that you want to give before we wrap up? Um, one thing that I think that sometimes people don't give themselves time to do is play. Um, I think as adults, because new technologies are coming about all the time, that we need to be able to take time and play ourselves to figure them out. Um, and often we don't do that. We have high expectations for us being able to figure things out, and it doesn't always work <laughs> in our favor. So that would be my last tip, play. <laughs> Great. Yeah, and, and something I think we should all allow ourselves to do a little bit more when it comes to technology is just that time to play and explore. So excellent advice there. Um, thanks to both of you for sharing so much. We do have, uh, for those of you who have put in questions we haven't um, had time to answer live on the webinar, we will get back to you via email. So give us a couple days on that, and we'll get back to you with some responses. Um, there were so many good questions today, and so I want to thank you all for being a participatory audience. Um, now uh, just a couple of things as we wrap up. I just want you to take a moment um, to reflect on what you might have learned and what ideas might be helpful for you. I always say I hope you walk away with one or two things. Um, and, and to maybe think about what you're going to do next. What's the next step for you with this? Is it that you're going to maybe uh, try to introduce a digital element into your next story time? Or are you just going to allow yourself a little bit of time to play um, uh, with some technology and see what it's like? And, and experiment with it. Um, I recommend just jotting a few ideas down. Uh, even if you're not a note taker, just give yourself a reminder so when you come back to this tomorrow or next week that you remember what it was you were going to try to do. Um, I want to make one last mention of the Reading Eggs product donation which is available on the TechSoup website. So if that's something you're interested in, in uh, taking advantage of, you might want to look that up. Um, again, uh, Reading Eggs on TechSoup.org. Um, and then I do just want to take a minute to thank our sponsor, ReadyTalk. Um, they are a, a tool that can help you collaborate and share information online if you have webinars or online meetings at your library or your organization. So thanks to ReadyTalk for being a sponsor. Um, they are also available through the product donation program on the TechSoup website. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining us today and say please hang on the line for just a brief minute. We're going to have a quick survey um, asking what you thought of this webinar today, and that's always helpful information uh, for us. So please do stay on the line. Uh, thanks again Lori and Tanya for sharing um, such valuable information with us today. And, um, and we will have that archive out to you very soon um, to those of you who were listening in so you can follow up on that information. So thanks again everybody, and have a great day. Bye-bye. <laughs>